Hey, it's Greg Otten here with MaritimeGardening.com. I thought I'd do something a little bit different uh, today. I did a presentation at one of the local gardening clubs uh, the other day, and I thought I'd take that presentation and, and you know, share a part of it with you because it, it's relatively topical for this time of year, and uh, I think people might find it informative. And it, it brings together a number of things I've, I, I guess I've discussed offhandedly uh, here and there in my videos, but never really addressed uh, specifically. So uh, the topic was, uh, among other things, cold frames in the winter, you know, growing stuff in cold frames, um, the general topic of using cold frames to grow vegetables. Um, so I'm going to talk about five main topics, really, like, let there be uh, basic heat, light, uh, location design, and what to grow. Uh, also a little bit about managing our expectations, in a sense. Um, also going to talk about... Uh, things you can use the cold frames for uh, outside of trying to grow things in winter and that is to say using them almost like uh, hot houses to get things started earlier in March and also just some general tips uh, based on my philosophy of gardening uh, and where I think uh, cold frames fit into that and, and how to make most of your garden so most important thing to get going inside a cold frame is heat right you need heat the soil needs to stay thawed in, in my cold frames uh, on a really cold night tonight I think it's minus uh, 18 with the wind chill it's around uh, it's early November right now and we've got a bit of a cold snap going on here I live in Nova Scotia Canada you can look up the latitude of that if you're, if you're curious if you really want to know um, your soil needs to stay thawed uh, if the roots are going, you know, every plant has a certain temperature that it needs to be to grow. And if the soil is frozen, most plants are just going to go dormant unless the roots are really, really deep. Um, and most of the kind of plants that you grow in cold frames, you're choosing plants that can take cold temperatures. Um, some, some plants will even grow if the soil is like 5 degrees Celsius. Um, but they need a miniature, minimum temperature to live. Uh, for some plants, if it gets a certain temperature below that, they might um, not die, but they'll uh, go dormant, right? They also need a minimum temperature to work, that is to say, to, to grow, to add <laughs> add material to themselves, right? I mean, you're, you're, presumably, you're growing them in a cold frame to eat. Um, so if, if you're harvesting from the plant and it's not replacing what you've harvested, then you're really not getting much, uh, you know, it's kind of pointless unless you've got you know, a massive uh, assortment of cold frames. If you only have two or three, like I do, um, you know, the plants need to be replenishing themselves after you harvest. And if it's not warm enough, it's just not going to happen. You're going to harvest them. It's not going to grow back. Um, so to get that kind of heat going on, I mean, of course, you have to capture sunlight, but also you need to do what you can to insulate um, those beds. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go along here. And also the, 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 you know, the cold frame needs to be aimed south. Uh, and the window is going to have to have some sort of angle to get the most out of that. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. Uh, where's all that heat coming from? Well, it's coming from the sun, right? It's a solar system. Uh, you need light. Uh, you need light for things to grow. You need it for the photosynthesis. Uh, you also need it to heat the, the ambient air inside the cold frame because the cold frame is like a little microclimate you're creating to fool the plant into thinking it's somewhere a bit warmer. Um, and if you've got enough light, you're going to get enough heat, the plants will stay, become productive and to some extent, right? And that allows that cold frame soil to stay warm. Maybe it gets a bit of frost or it freezes up a little bit in the evening, maybe the top crust, but then it thaws out, right? Even if it's freezing, if it thaws out every day and some heat gets going on in there. You know, cold frames, I have thermometers in mine. I would recommend you do something like that just to monitor and I'll go out there on a nice sunny day and check the temperature from time to time and on like on a sunny day in, in February or March it can get up to 20 in there right even though it's zero outside or below freezing outside but the big question is do you have enough light you need light do you have enough now this this uh, graphic here is from a website uh, that I found that has the amount of sunlight for Halifax. I live near Halifax, about a 20-minute drive outside of Halifax, which is the 
uh, capital city of the province where I live here in Nova Scotia. And this graph is kind of, or table is kind of interesting. It tells you how many daylight hours there are per day given the time of year. But it also tells you how much sunlight there is on average, right? So that's, you, sure, you've got daylight, but is is it sunny or is it foggy or whatever? It's, it's where I live, it's coastal. It's we're near the ocean in Nova Scotia, is a peninsula on the Atlantic Ocean, and it's always foggy. It's rainy in the morning, even though the sun may have risen. There tends to be a fog over the land, especially if you're near the coast. So this table is kind of interesting because it accounts for that based on the percentage of you know cloudy daylight hours or sunny daylight hours right um, like this this here for January it's saying in January 32% of the daylight hours are sunny and the other 68% are cloudy right? so that's not a lot of even though we've got nine hours of light uh, we only have 32% of that is sun uh, so it's kind of an interesting graphic so it's saying that in January there's only really three hours of sun sunlight right sun beaming down and and heating your cold frame and for those of you that know about gardens you want to have but at least six hours of direct sunlight per day ideally more for for optimal growth right so i mean we're just just shy of a month short of the uh, the winter solstice right now uh, which is you know around december 20 i don't know the exact date but it's usually around uh the christmas date um so i mean I'm in it's November right now and there's three hours of sunlight a day on average right where I am again if you're somewhere that's getting more sun uh, I'm not saying you're not getting I'm talking about where I am this is an exercise you have to go through wherever you are if you're getting more sun then you're gonna get better results and even within the province I live in um, it's, it's there's many different microclimates I'm near the coast so this is you know, far more representative of the conditions I'm dealing with. It's actually even more foggy where I live than Halifax, where this chart's made. So some of these numbers are even lower, I would estimate, for where I am. But we're talking three hours of sun a day in November, you know, just shy of three hours in December, uh, <laughs> around three hours in January, and four in February, you know, four and a half in March. So, I mean, there might be some days where you, that's an average. So, I mean, there's going to be, like in March, for instance, I, I, I sowed some uh, spinach uh, last year in March, and it, it germinated and grew because it says four hours and 38 minutes, but there's some days you're going to get seven. So, you know, it might get a bit of growth in that day. So there's something like 11 hours of light, and that's, that's counting dawn and, you know, dusk and that sort of stuff, right? So, it's probably more like nine or something. But... Uh, there's going to be days where you're going to get more than 3.48 in March, right? There's going to be certain days where you get seven or eight hours of sun. There's uh, going to be other days where you might get two because <laughs> it's just raining all day or there's a snowstorm or something crazy like that, right? Um, so these aren't hard, fast rules. These are averages, right? But they, it's important to, to think about that because you need to set your expectations. Uh, you know, where I live here, especially if you're in a place like where I am, I wouldn't invest a whole lot of money in cold frames. You're not going to get amazing resorts. And there are other gardeners in the province where I live that get better results than me because where they live, it's not quite as foggy and they get a bit more sun. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Manage your expectations and, and think about how much sun there is. Also, you know, where you live, your property, is there a direct line of sight from where your cold frame is going to go? to south because in the winter uh, sun's in the south uh, location and design the cold frame has to be south facing because if you live in the north i'm talking about northern climate right now because this is we're talking about cold frames and it tends to be people in northern climates i mean if you're on the other side of the uh, hemisphere then that's a whole nother thing but just just you know reverse everything I'm saying if you're in New Zealand or Australia or something like that right but you know um, I'm gonna speak to my context you gotta be south facing uh, there has to be an unobstructed line of sight towards the south you can't have things in the way or things blocking the horizon a tree line or something like that you really want to have a good spot you know when you're talking about only having three hours of direct sunlight a day uh, you gotta get all three right you can't have some tree that cuts that down to two or one right that's not very useful you know you're just not going to get the heat going on there 
Um, you want a slope window, take advantage of the angle of the sun. I'll talk about more, more about that in a minute. Um, what you can, whatever you can do to insulate that, to, to hold the heat in. You know, the sun's going to heat it up, and then it's going to, sun's going to go down, and it's going to start to freeze. Uh, you know, the, the heat's going to dissipate, and it's going to freeze. So whatever you can do to, to keep that uh, heat in, the better. Um, you can put insulation on the inside. You can also just bank things on the outside, right? Put leaf bags around it, or uh, piles of hay, or whatever you can get your hands on. Right? There's things you can do to sort of um, very simply uh, hang on to heat. Well, let's talk a bit about angle of sun. Imagine that, I mean, this is, um, you know, uh, east, west, north, south. So your, your cold frame needs to be facing the south on an angle, right? So imagine a, a triangle type thing here, uh, facing south. In the winter, the sun rises in the uh, southeast, and it's it goes up to about, you know, what is it, 30 degrees? It doesn't even go up to 45, right? 30 degrees, and then it sets in the southwest, right? So that's the path of the sun. So it's not going to be directly overhead. So your cold frame has to have a sloping window that comes almost down to the ground to take advantage of that that you know that crazy angle of the sun. Uh, so it's very important to to bear in mind if you can't position it on your property to do that. Um, you know, if you're somewhere very north or even more north than where I am, uh, it's probably a waste of time, right? Now mine, I'll tell you the dimensions of mine. These are my cold frames. And I've got other things I use to capture heat as well, which, you know, ar arguably might even be better ideas, and I'll talk about that. Um, mine are six feet wide from left to right here, and they're two feet deep. By, by deep, I mean from front to back, okay? Uh, in terms of height, they're they're made with two by six, so they're 18 inches high at back and 12 inches high at the front. And that design, I based this design on some diagram I'd seen in one of those like old 1960s garden books. Uh, but that's the problem with books. Often they're written from the point of view of the author that wrote them and where they are. Um, this, the angle that this this design creates is not ideal uh, for capturing sun in the northern hemisphere in the winter. Really, uh, the front of the cold frame it's, it's it's facing you and so it's facing south. The front should be only six inches high. It shouldn't be twelve inches high at the front. It should be six inches high at the front because I find there's a lot of shade. And I'll show you some pictures that that uh, illustrate that. Um, there should be, uh, yeah, it should be, it should be, it should have been lower at the front and even higher at the back. So I would have gone another six inches high at the back. If I can, I mean, for now, the windows are fitted to fit this thing, and the whole thing is built the way it's built. So I have to make all new windows, and I'll, you know, I just, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to let it, you know, when when those rot out or fail or whatever, I'll, I'll redesign them. It, it works for now. It's just not optimal. Uh, but I would have gone lower in the front and another six inches higher at the back, so it'd be a steeper slope. Uh, also, a problem with the with the actual dimensions of this is that things can only get so high <laughs> and they hit they hit the uh, hit the panes, right? And the, these windows I have are just made from plastic. I made I've got a video. Maybe I'll put a link to it below. But I've got a video where I show how I I, I made the frame for these windows. It just and it's just six mil poly. Uh, stretch over a wooden frame with a sort of dovetailed cross member here to keep them uh, true. And I just use different things for clasps. Uh, nothing too fancy, right? Anyway, that's some considerations about design. I would have designed them a bit different. And I mean, you can't really go much in, in terms of them being two feet from front to back. You can't go much further than that because you, 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 you're only accessing the cold frame from one side, right? Because it's this big window in the way if you're trying to come at it from the other side so you're accessing it from the front so if you're at the front of it you have to be able to reach with your arm to the back of it and I'm a pretty tall guy I can reach about three feet but it's, it's not comfortable for me I, two feet I can comfortably service the entire area here um, so if you're I'm six four <laughs> if you're my height or shorter you're not going to want to go much past two two feet right or you, you're going to run into problems trying to get at all the different areas in there 
you know, to deal with uh, weeds or just different kinds of things that, that can happen in any type of garden. You've got to be able to get at it. Uh, so the first one, um, the, the one on the far right over here, uh, I've, just to give you a sense of uh, what's achievable this time of year, <laughs> this is spinach I sowed around the 1st of October, right? It's it's like November 9th or 10th today. Um, I was, so I sowed the spinach like 40 days ago. And if you sow spinach in May, within 40 days, you're <laughs> practically eating it, right? <laughs> a lot of spinach is kind of, uh, you know, full size by 50 days. And these are, you know, an inch and a half high. And I planted them far enough back. So because of the, as I mentioned, the design of this and the front being a bit too high, um, this part from about here over, right, from, from the front to here doesn't get a lot of sun. The sun basically hits from the middle and all the way. Whoops. The sun hits from the middle and back just because of the angle of it, right? Um, this is all, sh this, this part here is shade tends to be. So that's why I put these here. I, might, I sh should have even put them a little further back. Um, but I, I chose to put them in the middle because, as you can see, I, I piled up all this rubbish around the outer edge. Right? I put uh, seaweed and hay and grass clippings and a whole bunch and paper and all kinds of stuff about, you know, maybe three inches above grade all the way around the edge to create an insulation. Right? So I, I put the the seeds in the middle <coughs> because it's in the middle of all that insulation. I've noticed in, in various parts of my garden where I've used plastic that if you have a whole garden bed, uh, the most thawed parts kind of in the middle and the outside will stay frozen in the dead of winter. Uh, <coughs> but all that ice and stuff will almost become an insulation for the middle part. So that's why I'm, everything's planted in the middle there. It's it's a little bit back of, it's not exactly in the center. It's actually back a little bit, not not two-thirds of the way back, but it's not exactly dead center. It's back a little bit. But anyway, it's like almost 40 days growing, and it's not very big. It's maybe the... Maybe these are maybe the length of my thumb, maybe high, right? You can see the the secondary leaves are very small, right? So I'm not going to be, you know, eating the spinach uh, in a salad on Christmas Day. <laughs> I don't anticipate, <laughs> right? Uh, but you know, spinach is a really tough plant. It doesn't seem to mind cold. So we'll see what happens over the winter. Uh, this is uh, the middle one, the middle cold frame, and I, I've got kale in here that I just moved from another part of my garden. I didn't seed this year. I had tomatoes growing in here all summer long, and when I pulled the tomatoes, I just plucked up this kale from other parts of my garden and stuck them in here. Uh, that's a lot easier, <laughs> right? Um, and so this kale will overwinter in here, and we'll, we'll see how much I get out of it. But, I mean, you can tell by how much, and these were like, my biggest plants are still growing in the garden. I took the kind of smaller uh, spindly plants uh, and the ones that weren't as big and put them in here because they'd fit, right, because this, this thing's only so high. Uh, but we'll see how much I can get out of these, right? But you can tell just by looking at this, let's say this, these plants leafed out a little bit more. Um, there's like one meal worth of kale here, right? If I harvested all the big leaves here, I might get enough for like a, a kale dish as a side dish in a meal. Um, but given that we're getting like two or three hours of sun this time of year, uh, it's not like those leaves are going to grow back, right? In the height of summer, uh, I can, you know, I harvest my kale all the time and within a week it seems to just regenerate and grow back what I've harvested. Uh, you, you, you can barely keep up with the plants. Whereas this time of year, if I harvest all the long leaves, uh, the other leaves might grow a centimeter <laughs> in a week, right? So uh, a couple meals and this is all gone, right? Same with same with the next one. Um, this is uh, other, I got a bit of Swiss chard and I got some kale. And actually in the foreground you can see the sort of shadier spot. <laughs> I put some parsley just to see how it would do. Um, but you can see it's 9 a.m. and the light. You see the shadow along here, right? The light is is in this corner. It's really not, you know, getting at the garden. That's because of the sides and all that sort of stuff. And you can see that the sun's coming out of the east. We're, we're well past the uh, fall equinox now. We're getting close, closer to the uh, winter solstice. 
what to grow? Well, you got to grow tough things. I, you know, I don't get incredible results with my cold frames, so I've got a fairly narrow repertoire of things that I've tried and grown successfully. Uh, these are all things I've managed to grow in my cold frame, but I mean, growing food in a cold frame in the winter to me is more like a hobby. Um, and if you watch my videos, uh, I consider hobby a dirty word for gardening. Um, the kind of garden I keep in the summer, the spring, the fall, it ain't no hobby. It's you know, it's it's uh, I don't consider it work, but it's it's beyond stamp collecting. It's it's a ma it's a major enterprise. It's major exercise. I save a lot of money on groceries. I get a lot of healthy food out of it and so on and so forth and it's you know it's just good good way to use your time and so on and so forth um, the, ca the caloric value of the food I get out of my cold frames is fairly minimal uh, and yes they're not designed optimally but I would predict given the amount because this all this whole thing runs on Sun right even if I adjusted them a little bit to, for optimality uh, I wouldn't be getting much more here because it's, it's just foggy it's very foggy so we don't get as much sun and we get a lot of snow and rain and stuff like that in the winter and ice and all kinds of different things it's just overcast a lot um, these are things I've managed to grow uh, Swiss chard re if it's really cold for a really long time and you're not getting any sun uh, the leaves kind of liquefy so the plant might survive the cold but the leaves don't <laughs> in fact it, you know it's supposed to get quite cold tonight and I've got some Swiss chard under a hoop house um, that's still despite all the frost we've had this fall um, it's 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 made it so far but man it's a hard cold night tonight so we'll see what's uh, left of it um, maybe I'll, if it's not too windy I'll try to do a garden tour this weekend um, my advice to get the most out of your cold frames uh, as opposed to trying to grow food in the winter when there's no sun <laughs> you kind of work you kind of working upstream you know kind of going against the stream against the grain there um, use them to get your garden season started a little bit earlier right start your spring in March um, you know you got a bit of you go back to that that light graphic right in March right it says 438 but there's you know I have sown things that time of year and gotten them to grow everything grows really slowly but you get the odd day where you're gonna have seven hours right um, you never know what's gonna happen um, so in March I'll put cold loving plants like kale um, certain things don't like to be moved spinach hates being moved so you really can't transplant you can't start spinach in a cold frame and then move it um, so if you're going to be growing things as transplants in the cold frame, uh, grow things that don't mind being moved, uh, like kale. Uh, Swiss chard doesn't mind being moved. Some things like that. Some you know cold tolerant plants that don't mind being moved. Uh, but you can also use uh, hoop houses. Uh, I'll show you a picture of that as mobile cold frames, right? Maybe they don't capture quite as much heat. Uh, as a cold frame in the uh, in the winter, perhaps because they haven't got all that wood and all that thermal mass. But um, in March, certainly when things are getting a little more sunny and so on, um, you can use them to thaw out a garden if they're designed uh, the right dimensions to fit a garden. And you can get seeds going in there, and that's a great place to ch to plant uh, something like spinach under where you're not going to you know if you're if you're putting the hoop house over the garden where the spinach is going to grow you're not going to be plucking them out of the soil you're just going to leave them where they are so they'll be happy and they'll grow um, and then you know maybe around um, I found around uh, late May early June uh, the cold frames where I've grown my kale in and pluck those out and move them to other parts of the garden and then put uh, direct seed certain heat loving plants uh, some are tougher than others I find like uh, first of June you can get away with planting uh, tomatoes uh, direct seed and maybe middle of June or late June um, you can plant something like a, a eggplant or a pepper or whatever and it will germinate and it'll grow and if it's an eggplant or a pepper you're planting it in that cold frame to grow in there right um, but that'll work. I, you know, almost um, 
Well, I, I had a good number. I started a little bit earlier this year. I, I planted some of my tomatoes like very early in May. And they germinated and they were growing and they were doing great. And then in June, we had these incredibly cold nights with frost and stuff like that. And uh, I had tomatoes growing in cold frame and I had tomatoes growing uh, in a hoop house. And they all just, just were vaporized in one night from extreme cold. And it just did not work. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, it, it's always, it, you know, for me, it pays to, to do experiments and try a bit early. You can always replant, right? I mean, what if we hadn't got that cold snap? I would have been way ahead of the game. So it's it's always worth it to try. But, uh, you know, if, if your resources are limited, you probably want to wait a bit longer. Um, anyway, the great thing about the cold frame or something like a hoop house is that you can direct seed a lot of things instead of having to mess around with fluorescent lights and potting soil mediums and vermiculite and all that foolish. I don't do any of that. Everything I plant. I direct seed, and you know, if something goes really, really wrong, and there's some sort of catastrophe, I just drive out to the garden center and get some transplants. <laughs> the worst comes to worst, right? Um, you know, you have that option. But for the most part, I can get away. I, you know, I direct seed almost everything. Um, a hoop house is a great uh, alternative to a cold frame. They're a lot cheaper to build, right? Uh, if your garden dimensions are fit, so that the hoop house fits the garden um, you know you can build one of these uh, this wire remesh it's like a four by eight sheet of, of heavy wire um, those are like ten bucks and you just build a frame that's slightly less than four by you uh, can be eight feet long but slightly less than four feet wide and, and you can turn the that that uh, wire into a into an arch archway sort of thing right and you just uh, attach plastic to it you know, using tape and there's various means. I've got a video where I build these things. Maybe I'll put a link to that at the end of this as well. Um, they're easy to build. They're cheap to build. These hoop houses are way cheaper to build than cold frames. And the great thing about the hoop houses is you can pick them up and put them wherever you want them. I mean, the problem with them is that, you know, at the height of growing season when it's warm, you got to stick them somewhere. I got a couple acres of land, so it's not a problem for me. But if you were living in a, an urban area, you'd probably want some sort of hoop house that you could. Uh, dismantle, uh, you know, and, and put away somewhere. And uh, if, if you want to learn a good way to do that, you might want to watch One Yard Revolution. Uh, the guy on that uh, channel has a different approach. I use these because they're incredibly tough. Um, last night we had 100 kilometer hour winds, and uh, this design can take that. You can see I got a string here holding it down, and uh, all that insane wind, uh, these these hold up through the winter and everything like that. So uh, and it's cheap, so it works great. And this is a heavy gauge wire. It's maybe three times the gauge of a coat hanger, so it lasts uh, years before it rusts out. And it's just six mil poly that's stretched over the top, fairly heavy plastic. If you wanted to make these even warmer, you could just drape another lever, layer of plastic over them, I suppose. Um, Another thing you can do, if you're just trying to jumpstart your spring, here where I live, you really can't get anything going in the spring until your soil thaws out. Everything freezes here in the winter. So you have to wait for your soil to thaw out, and you also have to wait for your soil to warm up, right? Uh, nothing's going to germinate if the soil is colder than the minimum germinate, germination temperature of a, of a plant. So... One thing you can do to, let's say you've got a, a number of gardens you've identified where you're going to plant cold-loving things, spinach, Swiss chard, kale, some things like some tougher things like that, right? Um, put a good mulch on there. This is leaves. And pile the mulch up so that it's almost shaped like a dome. And then this is just a two, uh, two, one by three, a one by three square frame with plastic stretched over. There's, there's two of them. There's one here and there's one over here. Uh, I have them that size because I can put them away and just slide them into my shed and, and you know once you know once it gets warm I just put these away and they're they're out of the weather for the remainder of the season so they'll last a while and I just weigh them down with rocks and you see how they fit inside the lip of this garden box so that way when when there's wind whipping around it doesn't get underneath them right and you put a couple of rocks on there but they're below profile so the wind can't grab them and lift them up and uh, blow them through uh, the side of my house or off into a tree somewhere <laughs> and I've had that uh, there was one time I left my garden and I left one of these 
hoop houses up on an edge instead of nestled down in. And it just flew off into the woods like a kite. <laughs> Everything's got to be tied down where I am here. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. But anyway, this is a, a much an even cheaper way of doing this. If space is limited for you, um, you put this on. And you can even uh, you know, move your mulch around when it's time to plant and, and sow your seeds. And just check it every day. And once you see the seeds... Uh, uh, germinate, germinate um, you have to remove it, right? Because it, it could get too hot there and, and the seed's got no place to go. It's, you know, there's no height here. Um, but this can really get things going for you uh, in the spring and, and jumps. It might be warm enough to grow things, but your soil just needs another two or three weeks to, to warm up. Um, so this is a way of breaking that rule and getting around it if you're somewhere cold and wet. Um, another thing you can do, uh, I did a video, I think I, it was called uh, Cold Frame Made from Trash. And this is just like a couple windows that someone had thrown away and some 4x4s. Uh, uh, four so all I did was I put one 4x4 four four in the front and I think two or three in the back. So it was pitched uh, south is on to the left of the screen here. Uh, so I had two or three piled up in the back. And then I just jammed a bunch of leaves in the side <laughs> to... Uh, you know, close the sides off, which actually worked out well because it closed the sides off and it insulated the box, but it wasn't airtight. So, there, you know, if there was an excess of heat, it could sort of get out. I planted spinach here last year and it grew really, really well. And this cost me nothing. It's just junk, right? And then, you know, as soon as it was warm enough, uh, I think I, I think I sowed these around the end of February, believe it or not. And they germinated, and they, they 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 started off very very slowly. But by I think April or so, I had some nice spinach in here, and then I just took this apart and put it away, right? Just because I didn't need it anymore. You know, once they get a certain size, um, you don't want to have to be mucking around watering them. You remove all of this and just let the rain in. And this is a great way to get uh, things like uh, spinach or lettuce started, right? Lettuce is a great one too because you can move lettuce; it doesn't mind being moved. So you can plant a whole bunch of lettuce in one of these things and then pluck it up and, you know, put it in a bunch of other gardens and uh, almost get like a, uh, a succession planting effect going because the, the lettuce that's moved is set back, usually set back a couple weeks. So it'll, it'll you know, uh, mature a little bit later than the lettuce that isn't moved. So you almost get like a two planting effect just by moving it around. So and I love using trash. <laughs> <laughs> I love saving a buck. Um, and, I, and my final advice would be to just make the most of the of the growing season. I just said summer there because it, you know, it would have had to be two lines. Uh, trying to keep the title short. Um, instead of trying to grow stuff when the whole world's frozen and nothing wants to grow, you know, I consider that you know, it's not futile, but it's pretty close to futile. Um, try to grow as much as you can when things want to grow at the height of the summer. So, you know, if, if space is limited for you, uh, if you've got a small yard or, you know, you have got a, uh, a garden plot or an allotment or whatever that's limited in size, um, you do whatever you can to grow as much as you can. But if you're in a situation like I am where, you know, I've got, I've got more land than garden, uh, if you've got lots of land, lots of space, just try to grow as much as you can during the growing season and then take that stuff and freeze it and preserve it and store it. I mean, I still have kale growing out in my garden. We're harvesting kale every few days and we're still eating it. We will be till December. Um, it's, it's slowing down in terms of its growth for sure. Um, but I've got two 4x10 beds of it, so there's a lot of kale out there right now. And kale's tough. It can take cold. Um, but I've also got... I don't know how many pounds of kale just frozen into cakes in my deep freeze. So I mean, the amount of kale if I t all of those garden or all of those cold frames I have right now, if I harvested all the kale that's in both of the ones that have kale right now, every single leaf, I'd have a maybe as much, probably a little bit less than one of the 1 pound kale cakes that I not 1 pound, but it's uh, I don't know what size what you call that, but it's a kale cake for me is if you took a large salad bowl and filled that with kale till it was overflowing, that amount of kale compacts down into a little frozen cake when you blanch it, right? So it's enough kale for, you know, four people to have a good helping on their plate sort of thing. Um, 
So all the cold frames, everything I've got, if I took, if I emptied them of kale right now, I'd probably get as much kale as one of those cakes and I get a whole bunch of those. So for me, that's a, you know, when things are growing, instead of uh, you stay on top of your plants and harvest regularly, don't let the leaves go bad. Don't let the slugs get at them. Don't let them touch the ground, right? Uh, and just be perpetually blanching and freezing them and putting that stuff aside so that all winter long you've got them. And uh, even though they're frozen, uh, they still taste better than the stuff you can buy at the store. I guarantee it, <laughs> right? especially if you've got a nice organic garden. And you're saving your money and so on. Uh, so, I mean, put your energy into that instead of trying to grow stuff when there's two or three hours of sun a day. And in late fall, instead of, you know, trying to <laughs> get kale to grow in a cold frame, um, if, you're, if you're challenged for sunlight like I am, and that's what I'm speaking to, um, Put your energy into, you know, taking care of whatever weeds occurred. I don't do much weeding during the garden season, but, you know, now it's, you know, there's, there's less to do in the garden. So take care of the weeds. Do whatever preparations uh, you need to do for the next. Get as much stuff done for next growing season as you can now, right? Before the soil freezes, before the whole thing's, you know, once the soil freezes, you're kind of shut down. Um, but do as much as you can now and, you know, but any project you have in mind for next year, you can start that. Now there's a lot of stuff you can do now. I'm building gardens right now. I'm re revamping a whole section of my garden. So uh, anyway, that's that's pretty much my my take on that. I hope that was uh, useful for you. Certainly a different format than what you're used to, but I just thought it would be a shame to 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 waste that presentation and uh, and and waste the thought. I know there's some people that have asked me questions along these lines. And uh, I'm sure there's some people out there that uh, will find it useful. So uh, thanks for watching. And if you, if you did find this useful please, uh, useful, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. Until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.